Okay, good afternoon everyone. It's 1.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Louise Savela, and I am a Consulting and Continuing Education Specialist here at Rails, and we are really happy to have Carson Black uh, back with us uh, this month to uh, talk about technology management. Uh, before I turn uh, the screen over to Carson, I just want to make a couple brief technical announcements. Uh, if you're using, uh, in the GoToWebinar uh, software, you have a control panel. It's usually on the right-hand side of your screen. If you can't see it, it might be minimized. There's a little orange button with a white arrow that's called your Grab tab, and that uh, will expand or, or minimize your control panel as needed. Um, everybody in the audience is muted. You do not need a microphone to participate today. Uh, if you have questions for Carson, uh, you can go ahead and put those into the questions box. And those will be sent to me privately. And I will be sharing those with Carson at the end of his uh, presentation. Um, you can send those questions in at any time. So please um, um, use that questions box. Uh, Carson did share a handout um, for everybody today. If you look at your control panel, there is a handout section that you can expand. There's a little plus sign next to it, and it's called the Who and What Worksheet, and you can um, get that there. I'm sure Carson will mention more about that in a few minutes. Um, uh, we are recording the program today. The record button is already on, so thank you to Carson for allowing us to do that so we can um, reference it again later. So I think that's all the technical announcements I have, so I'm going to say hello to Carson. Hi, Carson. Hi, Louise. How are you today? <laughs> I am great. How are you? Good. Now I'm pretending as if we didn't talk a little earlier. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I am turning the screen um, controls over to you. Very good. I'm going to show my screen. I'm going to show screen number two. All these things that you can't. Oh, well, maybe you can see screen number two right now. Can you see I a see, blank screen? I see a mountain um, landscape. Very pretty. That is, isn't that beautiful? So let me try this. Now can you see the uh, slide? Gotcha. Technology management. Looks good. <laughs> we're, we're rolling. Louise, thank you so much. Sure, thanks. Well, we're gonna have um, we're gonna have a good time today, and I need to warn everybody that the um, the information that I'll be teaching today that like don't be too scared. The warning is way too big of a word. Uh, the information I'm going to be teaching today is actually um, much of it is pulled from a a six week course that I teach online uh, through uh, Certified Public Library Administrator Program CPLA, which is a division or a, an effort of ALA um, to teach um, a library technology management principles. So there's um, things from this. We've never condensed this presentation into this size and this format. So I'm very cognizant that I might be overloading some people um, with things. And so what I want to encourage you to do, if it feels like it's a lot, um, just don't take too much on. Just look for the things that you think are the most important to you. And, uh, and as well, we'll have a little poll here so that I can uh, try to uh, adjust uh, my delivery and adjust the sorts of things that I'm sharing. But I just want to warn you not to feel too overwhelmed. Um, my name is Carson Block. For those of you who I haven't had the pleasure of, of working with or, or meeting or presenting for before, I'm a library technology consultant. I've been uh, only uh, uh, consulting for five years, but I have more than 20 years as a library technology uh, technologist, uh, most of that time as a manager of technology. And um, I believe that there is uh, no more important place in our communities than the public library. Um, the library is uh, one of those places where, without discrimination, we connect people to information, access, and ideas at no direct cost. We prepay those costs as citizens. And we find this to be so important that libraries are the anchors in so many communities. So this is why um, I do what I do. Uh, now I get to uh, support capacity <laughs> in libraries all over the country in all sizes of libraries. So I, I do work um, in the tiniest of libraries all the way to the largest, including um, uh, single little projects in little towns as well as uh, huge projects that have implications for uh, the, the country. And uh, this is this is what I do, and this is why I'm here. And so I hope that um, what I can do today is serve your needs in terms of, of your own needs for uh, information technology management. 
Now, um, again, this is not going to be uh, one of those um, uh, times when you just get to like sit. <laughs> I'm hoping that you will be engaged, but not over-engaged in some of the things going on. Uh, I also know something else, that the world of technology uh, for many librarians has been shrouded in mystery. It's got strange denizens, exotic rituals, and it has this incomprehensible vocabulary. Now, the world of tech is also a place of wonder, where some libraries, and those are the ones who are in the know, have been able to fulfill the needs of patrons and their communities in new and exciting ways. Now, in truth, technology is an institutional asset, and it as, is as essential to delivering library services as physical facilities. Now, too often, though, opportunities are missed simply because librarians don't understand the basics of what technology can do and how it can further your goals in your library. So this hour is designed to bring some of these things um, right into your hands, right into your lap where you can cuddle it and nourish it and let it grow, um, and also harness its full force in uh, not just serving uh, you as a library staff member, but really serving patrons. Um, that's why we exist. So uh, what I'd like you to start thinking about the, about the broader context of library technology, we will dive into some details, but much of this is about kind of um, uh, ways to think about technology in a way that makes things more uh, important or, or more doable for you. So we're going to talk about vision, we're going to talk about uh, library technology within the context of the greater technology market. Uh, show some pathways on how to bridge library goals with possibilities, strategies to make wise implementation choices, and methods to evaluate success. Now, again, we, uh, we've got so much here that as we're going, I encourage you, if you have a question or a comment that you would like to make, just uh, take care of it as it comes up, because we're going to cover so much we might pop uh, right into the next subject, and you might not have a chance to, to jot that down or, or to ask that question. I will answer all the questions that I can after um, um, our, the presentation wraps up. We think the presentation will take about an hour. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> because this is the first time we've done this, so this is uh, this is fun. So right, the first thing I want to know, though, is uh, two little polls. The first poll is who is here. So if you are able to, please vote in that poll, and Louise will tell me what the results are. I just want to get a sense uh, for a mix of public librarians to school librarians to special to academic. And it looks like our poll is posted, and the poll is in progress. I'm sure that people are just clicking like crazy. Yep, I'm going to give it maybe 10 more seconds. Do, 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 yep. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it looks like about 85% have voted, so um, let's go ahead and close that, and let me share it. And it says that 85% of the audience is uh, a public librarian. 6% are a special librarian and 10% are academic. And we don't have we don't have anyone from a school today. Okay, well that's that's good to know because school uh, libraries have uh, have special needs that are really different than the other 3. Mm -hmm. um, somewhat like academic but sometimes like really different. So that's good to know. Awesome. Well, the next thing that I want to know is equally important, and that is the size of library that you consider yourself. Uh, are you tiny? Because there are such a thing as really, really, really small libraries, and sometimes we forget about that. Um, then there's small libraries, medium libraries, are, or large libraries. So please vote and um, uh, give me a sense of uh, our mix of those different sizes today. All right, so the poll is launched, and folks are clicking away. I have a new song for this one. <laughs> Tell me if you can recognize it. Sounds familiar. It's um, a little Spanish flea, but I think by Henry Mancini. Okay. And they might have used it on the Newlywood show or something. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, about 90% of everybody voted, and we have 5% at a tiny library. Okay. Uh, 48% four, at a small library, so about half, 43% uh, at a medium-sized library, and 4% at a large library. Outstanding. Very, very good. Well, I will be sure to, um, to make sure that, that our range of library sizes are addressed in the things that I'm talking about. So thank you so much, Louise. I appreciate it. Sure. Thank, thank you, everyone. 
Sorry, I cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, one thing that I w want to start with is vision. And um, uh, the idea of, of, of vision, in fact, when I do, when I lead folks through technology planning processes, um, what we really want to do is identify vision. And ideally, vision comes first, right? There's this idea of, I know where my destination and where I want to go uh, is. Uh, oftentimes, though, especially in libraries, vision for technology emerges only after uh, folks have a chance to really understand what the possibilities are. I think sometimes uh, people are actually afraid to voice a vision because they feel like they, they don't understand enough about technology um, to, to be bold about that. I, I hope if there's nothing else that you can take away from today, uh, I hope that it will give you more encouragement to think about your own vision for technology in your library because really that's where it begins and, um, and it ends. Um, it influences so, so many things as we go forward, um, having that sense of vision and it helps make those little choices and those big choices when it comes to technology on that forefront. So I'm hoping that what we, what we talk about uh, gives us a sense. Um, this is important because this is a very confusing time to, <laughs> to be doing anything, actually, um, including uh, managing tech in libraries because we're driven by many of the things that technology provides, right? Electronic content, new communications technologies, uh, new physical technologies, statistics, uh, content creation tools, and especially rapid and ongoing change. Uh, sometimes that is in opposition to the pace of our institutional um, uh, things, our mission and vision and things. Um, oftentimes they include things like education, enlightenment, and community services. And the technology piece acts in a supporting role. What's really amazing is when you think about it, those two things actually move at a different pace, especially if you're used to working with a, a governing board or governing body. Um, th those policy things move at a slow pace where it seems like technology is is churning. Um, so uh, in, in terms of orientation, I, my ideal for technology is to make sure that it's first supporting institutional missions as well as to suggest new approaches and opportunities within that mission. Because some tech is so awesome that it's easy to get confused and we can start trying to form our mission around technology. Now while that is appropriate in certain situations such as the Bear Library near San Antonio where that was their their focus. They now have uh, two branches I think of that high-tech approach to library. Um, uh, in most cases, by and large, even with large libraries, um, uh, but, but certainly for, for community libraries all across the country, uh, we're not here because of technology, but technology is here to support the things that we need to do in our communities. So um, I like starting with the end in mind because it makes things super, super powerful um, uh, in terms of uh, how we can make choices. So tech in libraries often appears more complex than it really is. Like most things, the key is understanding what you want to accomplish and then determine how technology can assist you in meeting your goals. Now, some people <laughs> will tell you that they actually understand every little thing about every technological development, past and present, and even more importantly, that they understand all of the nuance present in the interrelationships between technologies. These people are better known as liars. Uh, <laughs> it's, there, there is no such thing. So if you feel like you're in the dark uh, in some areas, actually you're not alone. Most of us are, including me. I, I couldn't do any of my work without um, my interactions and friendships, uh, colleague uh, relationships, uh, so that I can uh, better understand things. Now all media undergo special specialization as it evolves. In human history, nothing as specialized as quickly as the internet and the technologies that power it. Now, I'm going to go on a limb here and say that keeping track of it all is impossible. So those of us who use uh, or make our living in technology simply pick the topics that interest us the most and we enjoy teaming with others with different and complementary expertise. It's not just a feel-good technique, this is an absolute survival strategy. The topics too tend to evolve or change over time, sometimes many times within a single day, which uh, if you're following the, uh, the issues with, uh, with Apple and the Department of Justice um, right now, that uh, is, a, is a perfect example of, uh, of that, that churn. Identifying what you want to accomplish in a clear enough manner, clear enough to write down using a few sentences is a great start. 
almost like magic, solutions will then suggest themselves from the wide range of options and approaches available. This is the power of vision. Now, this is your only homework. Aren't you happy? <laughs> it's as simple as it gets. And you don't have to do it. No one's going to check on you. Um, but uh, one of the places to start sorting out this vision stuff is kind of doing your own little assessment. Um, and it, it covers these different areas. And so this is on your spreadsheet, or I'm sorry, your, or your worksheet. If you choose to download that and fill it out, you might find it to be uh, helpful. The first is, who do you serve? And some of these things you're going to say, duh, I know who I serve. Um, I, I know the answer to these. I encourage you to write them down and to think through what it means um, uh, to have all this stuff in one place and to consider what that means for your um, uh, your library. For instance, uh, all libraries serve patrons of some sort. Now, what types of patrons does your library serve? Kids, parents, teens, adults, students, seniors, businesses, specialty groups, etc. Um, if you serve many groups, do you focus on one or several of them over other groups in the community? Libraries also serve the needs of staff with technology. What technology tools do staff need to do their jobs? And are there any special populations within these groups? Different ethnicities with different communication needs? Disabled? Underserved populations? Others? Next question, what is it that you do? What are you doing right now? What services do you currently deliver to your patrons using technology? Now, most libraries have a website, but what do you offer? Access to your holdings, general information, patron accounts allowing folks to renew items, placeholds, and more, uh, participation in consortiums uh, such as Rails, e-commerce for fi uh, fines and fees, subscription databases, historic collections, federated search, discovery tools, links to social media or others, and what in-house technologies do you offer? Uh, computers, most uh, libraries have uh, public computers, but what other stuff do you have? Is it a computer training lab, digital creation stations, maker spaces, et cetera? The other um, uh, two areas to think about is what you have and what you want. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You certainly already have access to an ILS and have computers for patrons and staff, uh, but do you have staff dedicated for technology needs? You know, when we're looking at the tiny libraries and the, the small libraries, chances are it's somebody on staff or no. <laughs> There's hardly any. Do you have uh, contracts for services or other forms of outsourcing? Do you have servers, network infrastructure, wireless systems, etc.? It's really healthy if you haven't had done that exercise to write these things down. The other thing is, what do you want? It's amazing to just ask yourself a kind of a gut reaction. What do I think we want? What do we? What I think? What do I think our patrons need? So be sure to use that uh, that worksheet and uh, also check, take a look at what things I might have missed. And again, that's not required at all. I just hope it's something helpful for you to start, especially as you. Uh, sort through some of the other things that we're talking about. Now, I hope this um, uh, this topic puts you at ease. This is the idea of bet be, be, uh, between proactive and reactive approaches to technology. Now, like most things in life, there are multiple ways to accomplish a particular objective. In my experience as a worker, as an IT manager and director, and as a consultant, I found that I'm most successful when I concentrate on the objectives and outcomes required of efforts and projects than on the exact path that I or others may choose to perform and accomplish them. There tends to be two distinct approaches favored by IT professionals, and that's uh, proactive and reactive. Now, proactive folks are the ones who look ahead. They're planners at heart, and they're typified by the old carpenter's expression, measure twice, but cut only once. Reactive folks are usually very quick thinkers and are equally quick to action. They love the heat of battle and often say, let's try it and see what happens. <laughs> I once had a discussion with a colleague about these two distinct approaches. Now, both of us are deeply experienced in the reactive approach, and we both admit that there's a thrill in those high-pressure situations. We both prefer to be proactive. I asked him which was better, and his answer really surprised me. He said, neither. To do a great job, you really need both. The trick then is in balance. Ideally, you have both approaches uh, within your library. Again, I know that some of the folks in the audience do not have a, a dedicated IT staff at all, but really, uh, I hope that you have a mix of these different personalities because somewhere in the middle there uh, is where we can really make some good choices uh, in terms of tech. Now, I want to talk about the cart and the horse and who is driving. 
cart and the horse. You might also know it as the tail and the dog. In the proper orientation, mighty efforts can be accomplished. And if a wagging tail is any indication, even enjoyed, putting these elements in the right order is simple, and you can do it every time. Among technologists, especially those adept at project planning, you'll awful, uh, 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 often often hear this concept applied in terms of drivers as used in the question, what elements are driving our efforts in this area? Or more simply, what are our drivers? Drivers are kind of like the action hero cousins of goals or objectives. For our purposes though, we're going to use both terms to mean pretty much the same thing. So once you establish some drivers or goals, then it's time to consider the resources needed to achieve them, the obstacles to overcome, and the time you will need. It starts with a question we considered earlier. What do we want to accomplish? If you do a good job with this first step, your entire effort will benefit. Identifying your drivers is the key to success in technology projects and ongoing efforts. As you go, especially when things get confusing, you will refer back to your drivers to see if you're on track. Upon examination, it's always possible that you might need to change tracks. Uh, you do that by modifying your tasks and your actions. But that should always be a conscious decision and one evident to all involved in the applicable effort. So drivers are part and parcel uh, to your high level goals. And drivers, though, are not obstacles or challenges in delivering your objectives. And that's something to, uh, to put in mind, too. Um, uh, sometimes uh, we confuse obstacles uh, that we must overcome with, with drivers. And, and hopefully uh, that is not what uh, first comes to mind when you're thinking about uh, something that you want to do or uh, solve using technology. Uh, another piece of context is thinking about computing platforms. This is so, so confusing to so many people. Uh, many of us, especially in technology, are passionate about our computers and the services we use through them. In an age when computers are becoming smaller, more powerful, and even fashionable, including ones that you wear on your wrist, that passion has become more pronounced. Now, techs who use and manage computers to make their living can be even more passionate, depending on their personal and professional experiences through trial and error, and hopefully through a track record of success. Many have formed strong opinions on the one correct path, and I say correct in little quotation, little air quotes with my fingers here, one correct path to accomplish a particular technological effort. And they're very faithful to their beliefs. Now, their beliefs can border on religious fervor. And they are sometimes unfairly but awfully, often comically referred to as, uh, for instance, like Apple fanboys, Unix, Unix zealots, Windows tools, uh, Windows spelled W-I-N-D-O-Z-E, and other inflammatory names from others who are just as passionate about their own biases. As to a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Techs with strong platform orientations will tend to look at every computing effort in terms of only what is capable through their platform, platform of choice. That's actually dangerous. In the old days, this was a good bet, um, and this is where this came from. And it was captured in the phrase, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. Uh, but it's increasingly risky as computing and communications increasingly specialize, combine, split, and change. So I often describe myself as platform agnostic. Uh, I, I like to use what works, and I use everything. Uh, although I don't know for sure that a true technology nirvana exists, I do believe there are many paths on the road to heavenly computing experiences, and the more options I allow myself to consider, the better the final outcomes. Amen. End of sermon. Uh, <laughs> what's bad about this is I can't see you. I could be falling flat completely when I'm joking around, so I hope you're, uh, hope you're enjoying that. Uh, let's think for a minute, too, how library technology fits into the greater tech ecosystem, and I know, I really understand this, you probably look at some of your tech expenses, no matter how a small or large you are as a library, and say to yourself, this costs how much? And you see the startup costs of your automation system, your subscription fees, the annual um, cost for computer up uptake for connectivity, you might begrudgingly feel like you're personally driving the market with your substantial investment. Now, if you do, I do feel your pain, considering that technology expenses are relatively new to libraries and seem to be growing daily, you would indeed have a point, but only when comparing your costs with other libraries. The truth is, is the library technology market is tiny compared to the overall tech market. We do have some special needs and some excellent technology vendors addressing those needs, as tech becomes a, an increasingly important part of library operations, it's also becoming a substantial investment 
and a growing percentage of our overall budgets. And it doesn't matter how big or small your budget is. Uh, dollars to donuts, if you if you take a look at it, look at it over time, you're going to see that you have over time been spending more money in terms of technology. Even so, in the bigger picture, we're really what's considered a niche market. That means we're really not driving too much when it comes to tech, but instead are in the back seat of this wild ride. Now, this plays out in several areas, including the specific functions technology can perform for us in libraries, the availability and development of new applicable technologies, and the cost of those technologies. The library community, of course, hasn't sit still. The open source software movement is robust in libraries, uh, and of course, uh, if you haven't, uh, if you're not familiar with open source, uh, the idea is that the underlying technology is free as in freedom, um, but not free as in beer. Uh, it's uh, the the under underlying technology doesn't have a uh, necessarily has a cost to it, but it's up to the user to develop that software through programming and and um, becoming involved in its development. So that's a that's a different sort of freedom. It's not like getting a free beer, but like getting a free puppy. Uh, <laughs> um, Next time you're working with a vendor of library-specific technology, especially if you're frustrated by something they can't do for you, I want you to consider for a moment the smaller scale of the market they're serving. There's really a magnitude of difference in the depth, breadth, and resources of a company that provides RFID systems for Walmart, for instance, uh, than one con uh, concentrating on the library market. Now, I'm not saying that as a way of saying if a vendor is doing a bad job that you should cut them a break, because they're two different things. But one thing to remember, uh, we are uh, librarians are demanding customers because I think we deal with a demanding public and we need tools that match our own passion and, and our own uh, targets that we have for customer satisfaction. Um, it, uh, our dynamic in the tech market though, we're, we're, kind, of, we're kind of there like uh, in a Dickens novel uh, with our bowl saying, please may, may I have some more of that technology. Uh, the role of training uh, is uh, huge. Everywhere I go, people talk about how they need more training. They need to do more training or receive more training. Training needs to be an ongoing philosophy in our world of technology. Um, to get the most out of our tech investment, we need to understand the capabilities of what we have and how to squeeze every last drop of functionality out of our systems. Now, we don't ever really buy technology, in my opinion. Uh, we only rent its capabilities for a certain time period. Specific technologies have a, a lifespan of usefulness. The actual time frame varies, of course, on the tech. But as the old blues song goes, when it all comes down, they got to go back to Mother Earth. One way to make the best use of that useful period is to commit to the time it takes to learn as much as possible and use that knowledge to get the most out of your systems. Technology is expensive and only useful for a certain time period, so not getting the most of it by providing training or seeking learning is akin to throwing money out in the street. Training comes in many forms, in-person, classroom, online, self-paced, peer-to-peer, through webinars like this, um, uh, through the organizational culture, and more. Now, how you go about training can vary and should reflect what works best. Uh, just remember to make sure that that is part of your approach. Um, sometimes when budgets are cut, uh, the training line uh, is the first thing to go. I would caution you against that, that approach and to, to try to think of it uh, perhaps in a broader fashion in, in terms of, um, of options. I think mainly because we have so many really good opportunities for training that, that don't have a direct cost tied to them. I think the main thing is uh, working them into your day, to carving out that time, to saying, I will uh, learn something uh, specific about um, this technology or that technology, and I'm going to make the time for it so that I'm not distracted, so that I've got the time to devote to it, et cetera. So um, this is where everyone wants to start. <laughs> How much is this going to cost me? Uh, well, there's a lot of costs uh, involved in technology. Um, my, my least favorite question slash most favorite question is, how can I save money with tech? Okay, so I have, a, I have a, an answer that most people hate. Um, you don't save money. <laughs> technology. You spend money. Now, um, bear with me here. You may disagree with me, and that's okay. Uh, relatively speaking, tech is expensive. Uh, despite my cavalier response, the truth is, is that you really can save money with tech, but most often in libraries, it's indirect, and it's through efficiencies that technology can provide for us 
in uh, areas across uh, the organization. Uh, we're going to use RFID, radio frequency identification, just as one example. Hopefully, uh, most of us are, are, are understand RF, RFID, but for those who don't, uh, briefly, uh, RFID is a touchless way of inventory control in libraries. So it's a it's a tag that uh, it emits a little radio signal. It doesn't need a power source. It's uh, really really cool. It receives its power over the air from the the antenna that's actually reading it, and it uh, can transmit simple information uh, that that equivalates to the barcode information that we would have on a on a book. Uh, with a barcode or any material with a barcode, as well as uh, security information, whether or not it's supposed to be in the library or outside, etc. Now, RFID uh, upfront costs in terms of dollars and the staff time, the retro conversion process of converting a collection, those are significant costs. Even with the cost of RFID tags dropping over time, and remember libraries are not a major influence in the technology market, a per tag cost uh, can be a significant factor as well, especially with big collections or small collections when you have zero budget, right, if you have no money for this. Um, other components of the system can add up too. A move to RFID represents a significant investment. Hmm, let's start thinking about it as an investment. Because for many, the efficiency gains from migrating to RFID can be equally significant. One common rationale to convert is to greatly improve efficiencies in your circulation. And if your circ department needs help, RFID could be a magic bullet. But if your circ department is already efficient, RFID can still have significant impacts by greatly improving customer service. And when combined with self-check systems, e-commerce at the terminal, and other services, it can go even farther. So in certain cases, the investment in RFID can pay for itself in terms of the efficiencies it can bring to your customer service efforts. So much to my chagrin, technology really can save you money. However, and I'm very careful to qualify this, the biggest gains often come indirectly and often through efficiencies. Uh, don't forget as we're going uh, forward uh, with, the, with the presentation, if, you, if, a, if a, something strikes your fancy, uh, pro or con, if you, get, you have a thought to share or a question to ask uh, after the presentation wraps up, um, Louise will be uh, collecting those and uh, moderating a discussion afterwards. Um, as with uh, this, when I teach my class, one of the things that I encourage uh, you, as well as all the students who have taken it, if something here does not particularly bear well with your own experience or if you if you have a different opinion of it um, please share that because that helps the learning for everyone um, I certainly have my perspectives on technology but there are a lot uh, great libraries are hyper local and that means that there's special uh, needs special experiences uh, throughout the country um, uh, where hopefully most of this applies and but some of it just may not be uh, good for you at the same time if something is really resonant with you if it really you really agree with it love to hear about that too because that helps others uh, when they're evaluating this information this might bore you to tears, um, but this topic is so important. Again, I'll, I'll refer you to the issue going on with, with Apple and the request to um, to jailbreak, or not jailbreak, but to uh, de uh, uh, unencrypt the, the uh, telephone of a, a suspected terrorist. Um, and uh, while we won't dive deeply into that, but this, this speaks right to technology policy. The uh, uh, predictions this morning, anyway, is that this, was, this would probably go all the way to the Supreme Court because of the stance that Apple and the Department of Justice is taking on this. So um, if you haven't paid attention to this, I would like to encourage you to, again, carve out a little bit of time because we are information uh, professionals in libraries, and this is the new frontier of intellectual freedom. Technology policy from the federal level on down can be complex, especially if you feel alienated by the terminology and the concepts, right? You may wonder why you should bother with it at all. What does technology policy have to do with running a library? With so much of our efforts being supported and driven by tech, policy has emerged as very important. If you haven't been paying attention, this really is a good time to start. You can get a jump start through our professional organizations, including ALA's Office of Information Technology Policy. Uh, OITP tracks many national issues relevant to libraries. There are also many other sources in our field, including organizations uh, like RAILS, like the State Library, um, especially in Illinois, you have such a, a robust um, library community that I think that you have some options there just to keep track. I also recommend looking outside our field and follow those who are following the big picture. 
issues like digital rights management, telecommunications uh, uh, fees and tariffs, the uh, E-rate, uh, net neutrality, copyright, broadband access, wireless availability, and more are vitally important. These issues are also big, ensuring that a number of information sources, including business publications, are also keeping a close eye. So if you, uh, if you um, uh, st uh, stock, uh, for instance, the Wall Street Journal uh, in, your, in your library and you have easy access to that, uh, give a scan to the technology column because uh, especially as it relates to commerce, they, uh, they actually they, they, they do a pretty good job, as good as some uh, technology publications. Now, they're not as nuanced on the tech side, but for a lay person, uh, there's certainly useful information there. Now, if tech policy is not a compelling interest to you, find someone else. Find a buddy who, who's following this and just talk to them once in a while. Have some coffee and talk about what's hot. Um, you don't, I, I'm very sensitive about burdening anyone uh, in this deluge of information age that we live in, um, but uh, make friends with someone else or, or find friends who this is interesting to and talk to them and ask them what's hot. Now, it's really important that there's an alignment uh, between technology and any existing plans uh, that you have for your library. This alignment is so, so crucial, and uh, especially to, to being super successful and, and making sure that our technology efforts go a long way. Now, you may or may not have a formal plan, so if you do, that's awesome. If you don't, I'm sure that you have principles that you operate under uh, that you want to make sure are, are aligned. So uh, remember that cart and the horse uh, a few minutes ago? That concept applies strongly to how technology ties into existing library efforts and plans. Modern libraries are driven by many of the things that technology provides, including electronic content, new communications technology, statistics, and more. But our institutional missions tend to have a different focus, including education, enlightenment, community service, and more, where the technology piece acts in a supporting role. So ideally, the role of technology is to first support those institutional missions as well as to suggest new approaches and opportunities. And, and I talked a little bit about that at the beginning. I also said some technology, technologies are so seductive that we can easily get confused. Now, these can be so great that instead of simply seeing how they can help support our missions, we reform our missions around their capabilities. Remember how much I hate that? Um, and sometimes that can be a good idea. Sometimes that is um, uh, the way things go. Again, the Bear Library uh, near San Antonio, Bear Libraries, uh, spelled uh, B-E-X-A-R, uh, for those who are not familiar with that want to look it up. Um, but you ha I first have to have a very deep understanding of technology and evaluate how close it is to your primary goals, I think, before you start forming missions around it. Now, that would apply to the, to the handful of large libraries that we have in our, in our group uh, today for this webinar, um, because there are, uh, as you understand uh, the nuances of this resource, uh, I think uh, you want to have special concentrations and efforts around um, how technology rolls. Uh, it goes beyond just supporting the institutional mission, but it becomes kind of like a little department. Uh, a, a department that goes beyond uh, things like maintenance and upkeep and really targets towards innovation and customer service, and it's oriented around that. Um, so that's that's kind of how things can, can apply from the very small to the very large libraries uh, in terms of this idea of, of the alignment. So um, I want you to put this concept into play. So think for a moment about library websites that you use. So think about your own and others. Now, it's likely that the sites are emulating a successful style that already exists, either among libraries or elsewhere. Study the homepage. Explore the most prominent links or features. Do you feel that style reflects the objectives of the specific library? Why or why not? Libraries that do the best job with their websites, for instance, have a really clear sense of how they want to use that website. And um, the one that I'll, I'll call out, now I haven't looked at it in, in a while, but it was, uh, it was within the last year, I think, maybe longer. Um, you know how time flies, maybe longer. Uh, but uh, Chicago Public, um, uh, they redesigned their website, and it's probably a little longer than a year ago, but I was very, very impressed that they took the, the initiative to push programming forward on its website instead of collections. 
Um, I think the, the establishment of collections is well known for Chicago Public Library, and I don't have any inside information here. I haven't had a chance to talk to anyone about the rationale for this. But it's very noticeable on the design side that they were pushing programs, programs, programming, and customer experience on that website as a focus. So for me, that was a really good example as opposed to, at the same time, uh, the Douglas County Libraries in uh, Colorado um, who developed a special ebook program. And so they were actually pushing forward electronic collections uh, on their website. In both cases, I think um, uh, both websites really, really reflected the primary purpose and, and focus that they wanted to present to their digital users. Then look at some other websites, some general websites, and um, you, I don't know that you'll see or get that that real, real sense of of uh, that that library's uh, mission and vision um, and how it wants to use technology to serve patrons. It looks kind of more like a bulletin board, <laughs> you know, and things like that. And I'm not criticizing that. I understand that there's time um, and, and thought that has to go into doing a good website. Um, but uh, this speaks to that alignment of technology or, or a way that you can evaluate the alignment of technology with, with the mission. Um, a little bit more on this, uh, on this topic. When it comes to emulating a technological look and feel, a lot of people, uh, even now, after so many years, name Google as a favorite. Now, Google and its many offerings is certainly attractive because the visible product is clean, it's fast, it's simple. And while it's true that creating a great search engine was Google's initial goal, to me, Google's primary objective seems to be data mining. <laughs> Uh, the, the idea of, 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 of monitoring and measuring the use of its services in order to improve those services and do more. And so a company today offers a wide variety and range of products and services. And, and I use them and I like them. Um, and it's in the business of monitoring though how we use its products to do a better job at generating revenue through advertising and other means. So when we say we want to be more like Google, for those who do, uh, do we mean we want a quick and simple interface? Do we mean we want a business model that focuses each effort on ultimately generating more revenue? Question is, is do libraries and Google share the same objectives? I don't think so. I think we have uh, mostly different, uh, different objectives. And so that's very, very important when we're looking at uh, something to emulate, something that we want to be like, that we're really clear on what they are and what we are and uh, understand what those gaps are. So vendors can add to this confusion. <laughs> Um, sometimes they put together a great package of dissimilar technologies, including the one you asked for, bundled with one or ones that you didn't know you needed, quote unquote. Uh, beware of those bundles. If you know your institutional objectives, you will also know if these packages would work for you. If not, they can steer you away from where you really want to go. So one way to keep things straight is to really reference, um, just to do a check-in when you're evaluating new technologies or new uh, ideas that you would like to introduce to your library. Uh, the first thing is is keep any written plans handy and refer to them. Uh, this includes any long-range plans that you have, uh, if you have a technology plan, um, etc. Now peri periodically review these plans with others and make the relevance of a particular technology part of your discussions that you have at any interval that you're able to do it. Um, it's really important just to check check in because it's important to, um, to be taken away uh, by, by tech. So a little bit closer look at the technology budget, uh, something to give you a little bit more of a measure. And this uh, should apply uh, to the very tiny libraries all the way to the, to the large libraries, of course, in proportion. Um, the proportion, of course, is, is, is different. Um, over time, as I alluded to a little bit uh, earlier, technology is snuck into most everything we do. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like a thief in the night, it entered some areas without much notice, and then it took over. Um, so I, what I'd like to encourage you to do if you're able to is to perform, perform a tech-centric financial inventory, uh, pull out your annual budget, um, and review it with someone who can help, actually help you dig into it a little bit. So if you know it well enough, that's awesome. Uh, if you have someone that helps you with your finances, call on them. Uh, if you've got an IT staff, definitely call on them uh, to look over things. Um, budgets are constructed in lots of different ways. So here's one way that you can, can um, kind of tear your budget apart and have an understanding of what you're spending on technology right now. 
If you already have a budget line for your tech expenses, you're off to a great start. Now, if you have a whole section of your budget devoted to technology, especially one with sub-ledgers within your overall line, you are sophisticated. So start with what you have, carefully considering exactly what that budget pays for. Now, if it's not clear what those budget lines fund, um, dig into that. You need to know uh, what that is and take some notes to, to keep track. Next, I want you to look at your collection. If you offer electronic resources, um, it depends on the library. Some people consider that a tech expense, others as a collection expense. Um, consider collection-related expenses not already accounted for in your technology line. Do you have self-check units, theft prevention systems, or RFID, security cameras, etc.? Those could be showing up. If not already accounted for in your tech budget, internet access and email systems are certainly a tech expense. Materials processing functions, whether insourced uh, th uh, through your own efforts or, or getting it somewhere else, uh, often involve a great number of technology expenses. Uh, if you use something like an automated materials handling system, that is arguably a, a technology expense, depending on how you construct your budget. Then look at your back of office functions. Do you have telephones and mobile phones? Do you use electronic systems for time cards, human resources, accounting, ordering? I think you get the picture. It can be more uh, complicated if um, if you don't tear this apart and start thinking about how those those costs go. So hopefully that is a that is a good uh, good way to go. Um, there's uh, some categories that I uh, I think you may find helpful as you're tearing your budget apart. I would encourage you to view those in within these four tech or the, kind of these four areas, um, uh, considering. Um, how to make best use of your tech money because you know I already said that we don't save money with tech but instead we spend it with the result of realizing some institutional efficiencies. Okay, with that outlook you might expect me to pontificate about loosening budget constraints, spending freely, etc. No way. <laughs> Technology spending can be a model of efficiency or it can be a deep, dark, bottomless hole that consumes all the cash you throw at it with no results. That's the worst case scenario. Budgets need to be created and carefully monitored to ensure that you're on the efficient side and far away from that black hole of spending. Mastering tech budgets is outside the scope of what we're doing here, of course, but here's a few simple concepts that you can apply to budgeting. Uh, one is uh, thinking about the things that we classify as ongoing monies, and these should be evaluated in an ongoing fashion. Be aware of areas that can be trimmed annually because they are no longer needed. Uh, for instance, typewriter repair. If you no longer have a typewriter, and you might, you might have one that, that's, that's getting lots of use. Um, uh, but if you, know, if you don't, make sure you take care of that. Uh, in any areas that should be shored up, like electronic media access, that's the, that's the idea of monies that you're spending every, every year. Um, you can think about uh, your technology expenditures in terms of new projects. These are things that are brand new this year or next year, whatever your budget cycle is. Um, and I would, uh, I would suggest considering these as investments, money spent up front with the intent of a longer term gain. Now, depending on the scope and scale, projects can range from shoestring affairs to significant cash outlays. To determine whether or not your budget is reasonable, your plan should include a return on investment or ROI component, measuring things like higher efficiencies, creating more and better resources and services for the same dollars, and yes, even saving money in some cases. But don't tell anyone I said that. Uh, and we'll talk very, very briefly, be briefly about um, ROI or return on investment in a moment. Now, new technology should be enthusiastically explored and understood, but from a budgetary angle, cautiously deployed. If an expensive new approach perfectly matches your institutional and technology drivers, it's probably a good investment. Being on the bleeding edge, though, costs the most in money and risk with the potential of the greatest rewards. Leading edge, less so on all three fronts, and behind the curve even less. If you pick your institutional point on that continuum of, of, of you know, um, uh, leading edge, um, or behind the curve, leading edge, bleeding edge, uh, it can guide your approach to, to new technologies. I do want to encourage you, though, to, to try things, especially if they're low cost, and especially if you um, don't feel like you don't have to completely dive in. Now, another area are things that are free technologies. Uh, these should also be explored and understood, but don't forget the old concept as there being no such thing as a free lunch. Um, when something is offered up as free, I would like to encourage you to peek under the hood to understand how the provider or vendor is directly or indirectly compensated for their product or services. What are you trading in terms of data or access for that service? If you like what you see, by all means proceed, but don't proceed 
without digging into it. And that applies to uh, many of the web services that we use, social media, um, et cetera. Have an understanding um, uh, so that you're making a conscious decision. Uh, for instance, I use uh, Google and Google Maps tracks me all over the place. Um, I love Google Maps because in my line of work I, I travel quite a bit and I need to step off a plane and get somewhere quick. <laughs> And so um, I trade my location information for uh, excellent navigation. Um, that's a conscious decision that I made. Some people do not like that, and they will not trade that. So it's uh, just one example. Uh, the same filter can be applied to free open source technologies. Now, I love open source, but I also know that it requires a commitment of time, which equates to dollars. It's, it can be worth every penny, um, but it's not exactly free. Um, determining the total cost of ownership, this, uh, this could take a long time to explain this, so I'm not going to. I just want to introduce this concept to you, and this is something that you can come back to um, uh, that I think you'll find super valuable as you go uh, forward. Um, one of the first questions that comes up when considering a technology expense is how much is this going to cost? It's a very good question. Uh, tech investments are often expensive, especially in the front end. That is, uh, when introducing an entirely new thing to, or system to your library. You may have even experienced a situation where the final cost of a technology thing went far beyond your expectations. If that hasn't happened to you, I want to hear your story. <laughs> I, think, I think that's happened to everybody. The best way to avoid such an unpleasant surprise is to upfront estimate the total cost of ownership, or TCO, for the effort. When estimating TCO, any vendor quotes are simply the starting point, and solely relying on vendors' estimates often lead to surprising cost overruns later, so nothing on the vendors. It's just that they don't always understand your situation. Vendors often do their best to give you accurate costs, but it's difficult for them to know all of the elements you face on your journey to the bottom line. Um, there's no one way to determine total cost of ownership, but this um, uh, this slide uh, is a um, is a um, a start um, when you're looking at, at doing something. Add up these costs, especially things that 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 have an ongoing uh, time component to them. So you might, for instance, buy a um, a, a computer, um, but you have a maintenance contract on that computer that you'll be paying for five years. Well, that would all go into the total cost of ownership. Let's say you are setting up a, a maker space and you need to uh, buy a table. Well, that table is part of that uh, cost as well. Or maybe you need to have a little area made, uh, which may have some construction costs or labor costs. Um, uh, uh, tied to it. Don't forget about the cost it takes to have a project, to devote time to developing a, a project or the time that, that goes there. All those things go into the cost of things. So we won't, I won't beat this horse uh, anymore, um, but this is one of the more, when I deliver this course as part of CPLA, this is one of the more popular uh, topics uh, because folks just, uh, some folks have never dug into what something really really costs. Uh, again, you can refer back to this slide. We provided the slides uh, already, and um, uh, this will give you ideas for things to look at um, uh, that you need to consider when you're thinking about the cost of something. You may have heard the, <clears throat> uh, excuse me, I'm going to have a drink of water. I've been talking nonstop for, uh, for 50 minutes. Having a drink of water on a webinar is one of the hardest things to do. <laughs> You may have heard this phrase, what gets measured gets done, but, uh, you know, I think it gets the most attention. Okay, so, in other words, if you're accountable to closely and factually monitor an effort or activity and record and report the results, you'll most likely do it. Now, this is a cliche in the business world, but sometimes a new concept in governmental institutions, including libraries. Regularly measuring the effectiveness of your efforts is a powerful method to ensure that the right things get priority attention in your day. Now, uh, early, I, uh, or, or, I'm sorry, another form of measure uh, is related to uh, looking at your high-level high goals. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit more about um, uh, uh, measures and evaluation in just, just a moment through the use of statistics. I just want to encourage you that if something's really, really important to you in terms of a technology effort or anything really, think about um, uh, how, uh, just ask yourself the question, how do we know we were successful? That's usually if you're able to um, articulate how you will consider yourself successful in any effort, that usually gives you a starting point in, in which 
uh, how to measure it. And one great um, uh, thing is customer satisfaction in your effort. We'll talk about that in a moment um, as we go forward. I can see right now, I'm just going to give you a time check. It looks like we've been going for 51 minutes, and I am guessing that I have at least another 15 to 20 minutes class material. Um, so um, we're going to get the most out of our time today, but I am definitely going to leave time for questions uh, as we go um, uh, go forward. So um, we talked about what gets measured gets done. Well, lots of other things uh, get done too. So uh, the question is, is should you continue doing that? There's one characteristic folks working in libraries tend to share. It's a sincere desire to help other people. It's one of the reasons that I'm in this line of work. I think it's a beautiful quality. I believe it's one of the reasons the public continues to hold libraries in such high esteem. The willingness of librarians and other library workers to go above and beyond is not the exception, but it is the norm. But this is coming from someone who's managed technology in libraries for more than 20 years. There is a trap, and I think you're already familiar with this. Trying to do everything for everyone or from an institutional perspective, trying to be everything to everyone is impossible. With the best intentions, many of us try, but I believe it's unattainable goal. Now, if you agree with me, and if you have limits to your resources, and I haven't met a librarian, a library worker, or a library yet that doesn't have limits, then you know that to do something new, it's likely that you'll have to stop doing something else. This is so, so hard. Uh, I'm going to talk about what happens in a uh, from an IT, solely IT perspective. Um, I, I won't speak today on uh, other library techniques. We're just going to talk about what happens within uh, an organization that's big enough to have uh, one or more uh, workers assigned to IT. There is a daily reprioritization that goes on in any, uh, any IT shop where the high priority ta tasks get attention and the low priority tasks shuffle to the bottom perhaps never to be considered worthy of effort again. That is not awesome. <laughs> That's just how it's done. This is why if you've worked in a, in, a, uh, within a, in a place with an IT worker, again, whether it's a one-person shop or whether it's a whole department, um, you might have asked for some help, and then you realize after a little while nothing's getting done. It's like, hey, what's happening? Um, and so that, 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 that reality is, is a real difficult thing. So I understand the complexity when I say, that um, um, we can't be everything to everyone and we have to say no to certain things. Here's a couple of, here's a trick that I think will work to make it uh, so that it doesn't create bad customer service, that your priorities do get met and that decisions are uh, correct and everyone's informed. Number one, all reprioritization should be a conscious decision made in consultation with others as appropriate and monitored and reported like any other activity. It's also important for others in your organization to understand any reprioritization decisions and perhaps even have the opportunity to challenge them. That's, a, that's a, not always appropriate, but sometimes it's a real healthy thing, especially with a, a controversial uh, or nuanced a decision. And it may be good for, or it'll be good for you to have a personal breadcrumb trail later to help you remember why some efforts lost out over time. Um, uh, the, this conscious reprioritization, not on the fly, but saying, okay, so we, we've got this new stuff coming up, for instance, um, some of the old stuff isn't fitting. And being conscious about that, being deliberate and communicating uh, strongly is so, so, so important. The communication and the prioritization is usually what is missing, and it's just because we are so busy. But I would say that in public institutions, trying to strike a balance here is very, very, uh, very, very difficult. Now, on the IT side, uh, we often have little tools, uh, and I use them in my consulting as well, to make sure that we're keeping track of things that we said that we were going to do, and that we have a, a visible accountability. So if you're in a larger organization, you probably have an IT help desk where, uh, where it keeps track or keeps log of the uh, requests that you've made, and it also helps the IT department manage its workload. That's one way um, uh, to do things uh, in, that, in that respect. When you're a small shop, I know it's, it's like, I just needed to go home. It was the end of the day. Of course I couldn't follow up. Uh, what I'm saying is to kind of try to rethink that because it's likely, it's probable that as we go forward with technology that we'll be faced with that constant reprioritization of task level things. So um, uh, we talked about um, a measurement being a, a kind of a, a great indicator to help us 
uh, scope our efforts, etc. So what are the most important things to measure? Well, the nice thing about technology is it often comes in with built-in ways to measure stuff. Uh, so for instance, when I was writing uh, this, this thing the first time, uh, my word processor, processor automatically uh, created statistics for me. It told me how many words I had, um, how, many, how much time I was spending writing, etc. Now that same report um, uh, also has other cool data things. Now for our own technology efforts, the sorts of things you measure should first be by, uh, guided by any basic requirements that you have at the state or, or uh, federal level, uh, such as annual reports or surveys that most libraries participate in, as well as any additional institutional objectives um, uh, that you have, things that are very, very important to, to you. You probably are already familiar with measures that you submit as part of annual surveys, but you may not be aware of all the statistical gathering places in library land. A few to sample are uh, uh, here, and we won't dig into that But, um, uh, uh, but since we're going over time. Um, but if you're not aware of these uh, five websites, the Public Library Data Service Statistical Report, the ALA Office for Research and Statistics, the Library Research Service, Pew Internet and American Life, and Library Edge, take a look. Um, uh, just to see, because uh, there are also pots of data that you can use um, uh, when you're thinking about uh, your own efforts. Um, there, I, I think what I'm going to do, just so we can allow time for questions, I'm not going to go super deep um, uh, into into this page uh, or, or to this requirement. Um, but uh, what I want you to do, in fact, I'm going to go off script here, and I'm going to suggest that when you're looking at measures related to your technology, um, uh, try to have an understanding first of the things that you're already collecting. So when it comes to things on the ILS or website, uh, there's certainly useful statistics that are already being gathered that tell you something. And these statistics are important not in of themselves, but when uh, con considering changes over time. Um, one, uh, sometimes uh, we, especially in technology, um, we have an interesting conundrum. Uh, I'll give you an example of changes over time that are very, very significant. In many of the libraries that I'm, that I'm working with, their user sessions for patron PCs are not growing. So they're not, for a while they were growing and they just couldn't supply enough uh, patron PCs. Um, so that's become kind of a static measure. For some libraries it's gone down. At the same time, the use of their internet bandwidth, their Wi-Fi usage in their library has been increasing dramatically. Um, anecdotally, we can, we can say that, that the results of understanding those two items is that uh, because of, uh, in some areas, patrons are able to afford their own technology to bring into the library, that they are uh, still finding value in the library as a place to be and a library as a place to connect to the internet. They just might not, in these certain libraries, require that physical uh, computer as much as they did in the past. That's an example of thinking about uh, things to track uh, if that's important to you as a way to help inform um, what you're doing. Now, of course, if you're focusing on your website, uh, development of your social media, there's all sorts of metrics that you can, um, or that you can track, uh, track there. Now, there's also some advanced statistics, um, uh, and for those of you who uh, want to geek out even further, you can overlay some of your statistics that you're gathering and mash them up with other um, uh, things like Google Maps, for instance. Um, uh, you know, you might be, in, 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 in fact, in the, 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 the efforts of planning, these are things that you absolutely want to know. Um, where do your patrons live physically? Um, where do they work? What is the library that's closest to them? What other libraries do they use? How many live within a one, three, or five mile radius of, of your library? What are the demographic and ethnic makeups of the neighborhoods around your libraries or your users? Um, things like that. Um, so uh, I know for, for some of the tiny libraries and small libraries, uh, you haven't had a chance to really think about this, but if you're, um, because you're busy, right? You've got things going on. But um, if, you, if you have the opportunity to, um, for instance, grow or to, to, to have a different location or think about your service levels, exploring options to be, be using data that's available to better understand your community uh, can be a very, very, very um, strong influence on um, the services that you, you decide to focus on. Remember I said there's things you want to do, maybe some things you want to stop doing. Sometimes this data can give very powerful direction in terms of uh, the services that you want to focus on in your library. 
and sometimes it's surprising, uh, especially as uh, we have uh, uh, immigrant populations um, uh, opportunities coming up. Um, uh, a lot of times we just see folks coming in through the door. Sometimes we don't even know they're there because they don't come to the library. I, I know that in a lot of uh, Spanish or, or, or um, uh, Latino uh, areas, uh, sometimes the library can be and uh, sometimes it's totally trusted and it's a robust part of society. Sometimes it's looked at as a government institution from a, a Latino immigrant, not necessarily trusted. So, um, and most of the libraries I work with want to fix that issue. They want to change that perception. So that's an example of using advanced statistics to um, help you with things. Now, be careful <laughs> because statistics, like any baseball fan can tell you, they can be extremely addictive, right? And so uh, we want to be careful not to go down the rabbit hole in statistics, but really think what statistics are important to us to make decisions or to manage your library, uh, whether it's you know decisions about technology or uh, services. It doesn't matter. Um, things do change over time. And so there's a couple of methods for uh, course corrections um, that you can do. Like what, what happens if things aren't going as you plan? Well, you have at least two choices. Uh, one is to lie down quietly and hope the problem will go away. Uh, <laughs> that's my favorite. Uh, the other is change your course of action. And I, I want to just briefly encourage you um, uh, to not be wed to the way in which you uh, plan to do something, but be more wed to the goal that you wish to accomplish. And allow yourself that, that luxury of failure I know it's a taught, that's a bad word in a lot of places, but allow yourself the luxury of failure in the specific path and allow yourself the flexibility to change that path in order to reach, reach the goal. Um, I'm weird. I really don't mind abandoning uh, courses of action that are not getting me to my, to my goal. Um, many technologists feel that way, but as, as many uh, also feel uh, wed to their certain direction. That's, we talked about that with uh, uh, the choice of platforms, etc. Um, I don't think that the, 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 the exact method is nearly as important as the goal that you're trying to uh, achieve. So that's just what I want to encourage you to do when it comes to technology, because technology does give us lots and lots of options to solve a problem. So if the first thing that you try doesn't seem to work, it's okay to abandon it and to try a different way uh, in search of that goal. Um, there's course corrections for your budget. Uh, I, I was talking about some different ways to think about, about the budget earlier. Here's an even simpler um, uh, way to think about your budget. This will help you with course corrections, especially if you're able to, to look at this. You should look at this at least once a year to see where your technology budget is going. I found it always helpful to think about it in three broad chunks. One is maintenance, and they're not necessarily equal like this either. So um, uh, just, just so you know, um, uh, that wouldn't that be nice. Uh, that's the peace sign guiding me to uh, a great technology budget. Um, one is uh, maintenance. This is the stuff uh, that you have and just keeping it going. And that's a very, very, very important uh, piece of it. The other category is thinking about your technology in terms of growth. New stuff that you know you'll need. It's stuff you don't have now, but you're going to be investing in it in the next budget cycle. This is not necessarily snazzy stuff. This might be things like replacing your switches in your server room, which I'm sure you're saying, who cares? Well, you do. <laughs> that's the core of things, right? Uh, that's what makes all the other stuff work really well. So um, this is just new things that, that, that will occur over time. They're not necessarily sexy things, they're just things that you need. The third is what so few libraries invest in, and that's innovation funding. New stuff that you don't know yet that you'll need. I know with a tiny budget, I'm, I'm asking you to do the impossible, but if you can save just a little bit to be able to take advantage of opportunities within your budget cycle, I think that you'll have a better um, chance with technology. And I'll, and I'll give you an example. Um, one of the hottest technology things that will be emerging this year is virtual reality. You might have heard of Oculus Rift. You might have heard of um, uh, Microsoft's product. Um, uh, the idea is that these are 
These are goggles that you wear and headphones that allow the user to immerse in a 3D environment. And it's almost like being inside of the matrix. Uh, whether or not you think that's good or bad will <laughs> depend on a lot of things. However, it's, it's a thing, and it's a thing that's going to be out. Um, the, the virtual reality from Oculus, anyway, from that which is owned by Facebook, um, they're working really hard. They want us all to be, have this, this sort of technology. Third. So they're working really hard to get it kind of in that video gaming price point. Um, I, I heard, uh, I think I heard uh, Mark Zuckerberg say yesterday that they're trying to target $100 uh, for a headset, right? So a virtual reality headset. Now, I don't know if that'll happen or not. I've heard a lot of different prices about it. But the, the bottom line is, um, uh, despite the ways that it can be misused, uh, virtual reality has um, a huge, huge, huge implication for learning uh, as we go forward and accessing um, a different, not just different um, entertainment experiences, but anything that we see on a screen um, will be available within some sort of virtual or augmented environment. So um, uh, as with many technologies, uh, libraries don't have to dive in and be the experts in virtual, e uh, virtual reality. I certainly think we all need to, if we're able to, experiment with it, play with it, learn about it side by side with patrons, and understand what this what, what this might mean and how we might want to use it again to further our mission and our community, the things that we want to do. Um, and so you can't do that if you don't have a little money there, little resources in which to tap to make that happen. So we talked about the. Um, the maintenance, we talked about um, uh, the growth and the innovation. Uh, the last subject that uh, we'll take on, because I am duty bound to talk about this uh, from the beginning to the end of my life, um, is computer and data security. Um, are you concerned every time you hear about a security breach on the internet and what risks might be present at the library? Well, you should be. Um, libraries are not big targets for hackers and crackers, but we do collect personal data, and we serve many patrons with computer access. By statute and by culture, we protect, protect patron confidentiality. We have a responsibility to protect patrons from cyber threats and also from each other. Now, security can be complicated, but one concept can help guide your approach. Security is not something you do one time. It is an ongoing process. The best way to approach security is through multiple layers. It's really not enough to buy an internet security software package to install on your PCs or servers and then say, hey, it's all good. Um, so that being said, uh, if you don't have an internet security uh, software package on every one of your Windows PCs um, and you don't have up-to-date virus definitions, turn off this webinar now and go take <laughs> care of that. Uh, that's like a, like a baseline. I'm, I'm saying two things, I guess. It's, that's not enough, but if you don't have at least that, you have to start somewhere. Um, uh, if you don't know whether you do or not, um, you need to find out it became even more urgent. I'm um, kind of being cheeky. I, 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 most libraries I, I work with, I, I, it's been so long since I found an unsecured public workstation. I don't think it's, uh, it's certainly not happening for you, but, but it is something to keep in, in your mind as part of your overall technology efforts. Uh, on bigger systems, a data breach is always a risk. Um, one of the, one of the uh, approaches to this historically has been not to collect more data from patrons than you absolutely need to do uh, library business. Um, backups, uh, testing backups, uh, making sure that your important data, things that can't be uh, 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 replaced easily, um, are, are backed up, not just someplace close by, like maybe you've got a thumb drive or a server, but you should also back it up someplace else, like in the cloud. Um, so if you've used a service like CrashPlan or even Dropbox, that's a way of making sure that you uh, physically uh, have a place for things to be backed up. And again, this is not a class on backups. I'm just saying that, and security, I'm just saying that uh, as we get wrapped up in, in tech, we also have to remember that there's some basics that are mission critical for us, and that's making sure that our workstations are safe for us as staff, that our patron PCs are not just um, safe in of themselves, but they're, they're configured in a way where we also protect patrons from the bad things on the internet, but also from each other, right? There's, we have, that's part of our thing we have to consider with technology, et cetera. So this is a big topic and way too much to, uh, to go on. So um, I think we're doing pretty good on time, and we should have time for uh, any 
questions that might have come up in this first ever crash course of uh, six weeks of, of, of um, material in just over an hour. So I hope, I hope people are not too uh, inundated right now. Hey, Louise. Hi, hi, Carson. Thank you so much for that. You really uh, gave us all a lot to, to think about. You, cram you did cram a lot into that hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> It was all good. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I do have some questions that came in um, during our, our, your program. And I'll just say, you know, we've got some time. We've got about 15 minutes before we end. So if anyone has any other thoughts or questions, please go ahead and type those into the question box and we'll get to as many as possible. And um, somebody has asked about the slides um, to the program and um, Carson has already shared those with me and I will um, get those posted with the webinar recording on the Rails website. I had put the link into the check box, our, our chat box a few minutes ago. So um, when everything is up and ready to go, uh, everyone who is registered will get um, a, an email alert to let you know that the slides and the recording are available. So, okay, on to questions. Um, one person asked that they are looking to replace their telephone system. Do you have any um, thoughts on what they should be looking at technology-wise? Uh, yes. Um, uh, again, I think that the, the first thing that I would look, uh, look to is, um, or, or the first uh, a way to approach that is to make sure that you understand any larger ecosystem that you might be a part of. So if your library is not um, uh, an individual library or a standalone library, if you're part of a library system uh, or part of a city government, that you uh, talk to the proper people there so that you're coordinating the, 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 the telephone systems because those are, those are critical. Um, most uh, folks are, are going to voice over IP systems or they, they also call it internet telephony, which is our I don't, I don't even know if I'm saying that right, uh, but but it's uh, IP telephony. I'd rather say VoIP, and most people do, but it's technically the other. Um, and that's using our data networks in which to communicate voice information. Um, there are still needs for analog lines and analog communication within even digital voice systems. These are for things uh, such as alarm uh, systems require uh, that analog line. Uh, fax lines are still healthy and used in libraries and they require analog lines. And so um, part of the design also uh, for the VoIP system also uh, is uh, um, uh, it's a requirement to also look at your data network. Uh, to see where this might live. And, and for some libraries, uh, when I say the data network, I mean the, the place in the back room with all the blinky lights. Um, some people, uh, are, they have a good enough network where they're able to integrate and protect that voice information on their regular data network. They can do advanced uh, things to manage that network so that the voice system is always there and it's not competing with other needs in the network so that it can happen, uh, the voice stuff can happen like it's supposed to. Other libraries have completely different systems for their VoIP networks in, in order to ensure a quality. So I hope that's, that's helpful as you're looking at uh, a new telephone system. All right. Thanks, Carson. Uh, the next one is, uh, do you have any thoughts on Google Cardboard from this perspective of managing technology? It, it is the, the, if you can get your hands on it, which I just haven't been able to, I think it is the quickest way to experience R. <laughs> it is awesome. Um, Louise, are you familiar with uh, Google Cardboard? I am not. If you um, could just let us know what that is, I'd appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, well, I know it sounds weird. It's like Google Cardboard. Right. That doesn't that, is that? Are you supposed to stand on it and slide down a hill? What What is Google Cardboard? Uh, Google Cardboard is kind of a neat, um, uh, low tech way to turn your phone. I think it just works on Android um, into a kind of a pseudo uh, uh, 3D uh, virtual reality gaming. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, virtual uh, reality environment. So uh, basically, it, it's a it's a it's a cardboard thing that you place your phone into that divides 
um, the, the vision based on a division on the screen, like your eyes. It's like, um, a, a, and you put your phone, you attach your phone to the cardboard, you put the cardboard over your face, and you, uh, you suddenly have something that, that does a kind of a cool job of emulating uh, a three-dimensional environment like you would see in a uh, more expensive uh, virtual reality goggle system mm -hmm. like Oculus uh, Rift. That's cool. Uh, the person who asked the question says it also works for iPhones too. So. Oh, it does. Good. Thank you for that that clarification. I've been trying to get my hands on it. I've had the other stuff, and I remember the New York Times gave it away when I was traveling in New York to subscribers um, a few months ago, and I've just I've been meaning to to do that. I haven't been able to do it, but if you can get your hands on it, uh, and which it may be simple, do it. it. Sounds like fun. All right. And then kind of related to that, somebody else is asking about the Mattel ViewMaster virtual reality as well. I, I think that is the, the, the coolest um, uh, tie-in. Uh, I, like many uh, people, have fond memories of the, the first kind of experience looking through a ViewMaster. Um, for those in the audience who haven't done that, that's, that's an early way of doing 3D uh, using a, a little device that used film uh, with properly proportioned um, uh, uh, still photographs that actually goes back a long time. We can, we can find uh, on historical collections, you can find 3D type photos from the, the beginning of, of photography. Um, but um, you, you held it up to the light and uh, had this great experience. So while I haven't used their product, I hope to be able to see it. At, uh, I'll be uh, going to South by Southwest Interactive this year um, where a lot of this stuff is, is gathered and, and uh, is out for sharing. I haven't used it, but I, I, I think it, I thought that was such a clever uh, tie-in and development as far as using the ViewMaster name to describe a new product that uh, brings a new type of 3D to people. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, I've got two more questions, and we still have time if anyone has any other questions, too. Um, uh, this person says that sh she is the, and the is in capital letters, a uh, new person for tech in their eight-employee village library. Ah, uh, yes. And well, congratulations. That, for that ratio is awesome, actually. Yeah. applaud your library for investing in you. That's great. Yep. So she says that she's starting from osmosis type knowledge and has had no formal training. And um, she's wondering if she should consider tech training at a local community college and getting some kind of networking certificate or if there's something else that you can suggest. Yes, um, that is, uh, is so, well, welcome, number one. I just want to say welcome um, to, to taking this on. A lot of, um, uh, traditionally, a lot of um, technologists in, library, in libraries have been the accidental technologist. Um, <laughs> it's because they showed an aptitude or just maybe sometimes a patience uh, for tech, and it's like, okay, you're in charge of this now. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's been a long time. Um, in terms of training, I think um, uh, the first, and this is a this is a totally serious answer now. Um, I would really take a, 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 a do your own assessment of where the library is at. So um, do a physical assessment, like what what kind of shape is the the technology infrastructure in, and I mean the the structured cabling, the switches, uh, the Wi-Fi access points. Uh, as well as the computer hardware and software that you're offering to patrons and to staff. Um, not an exhaustive assessment, just a little one. Just do your own and talk to the to the users, especially on the staff side, to talk about um, uh, experiences that they're having with tech. And use that as a guide for the sorts of uh, additional training and education that you uh, should seek first. To use that as a way to prioritize your own uh, training program. It can be confusing because technology is so fragmented. If you go to a community college, you may spend a lot of time in a class that is not you know, directly related to the things that you actually need to accomplish at the library. So mm -hmm. start with that assessment to start getting a sense of the most important needs and then start looking around for resources. Um, I would say that to begin, you probably don't need to go to any classes, um, but to use uh, YouTube, for instance, or to use a service like uh, Spiceworks or any uh, chat boards 
uh, on the internet where texts gather to start answering some of your questions. So I would actually, um, uh, that's not a long-term strategy, but I think for your initial strategy, try to find where your pressure points are uh, right now and then seek um, kind of hit and run, no cost or low cost uh, resources via the internet to start uh, trying to understand a little bit more about the basics. That's great. Um... You know, somebody else um, while you're talking chimed in that she's from a 25-person library and is kind of in that same situation that she's uh, the, new, the new IT person and is kind of learning just on the job as she goes with no formal training. So, um, well, welcome to you as well. Yeah, um, but those are great suggestions. And um, the last question I have is, um, what is the name of your CPLA course? And I don't know if maybe you could talk about that. Um, in general, oh. too, what that means? <laughs> sure. Yes, yes. Um, it's called Management of Technology, mm -hmm. and CPLA stands for the Certified Public Library Administrators Program, and uh, it's, through, it's offered through ALA. The primary, like the way this uh, curriculum, uh, the way I wrote it, it was for CPLA, uh, but since then, uh, when ALA has offered it, it's been offered about twice a year uh, for, the, for the past few years. Um, we, we've had... Um, not just CPLA candidates, but actually people that just were generally interested in technology management and um, uh, concepts. And one of the scariest things for me is I've had peers take the class. These are people that I know and love and respect, and they've taken the class to talk about, you know, keeping me on my toes to uh, <laughs> have a peer out there. And, and you, but you probably noticed that through the, the things that I talked about here, uh, is that I believe that the most important um, a part of the class, and we do go through a lot of specific exercises, um, two things are really important. One is a framework in which to make decisions from a library perspective. Um, because most of the stuff that, I, that I've talked about today, I think a lot of people have feel, felt alienated from, and I've tried to make it um, accessible because I believe any, no matter what size library you are, um, a library director, a library staff member needs to have these basic understanding of this, of the, these essential resources. And if you do have that understanding, you can make excellent decisions. So that's part of it. Um, the other part of the class itself that I think makes it so enriching is that it's designed for high interaction between classmates. So my role is to be a guide and to direct people around the topics that I think are important and helpful. It's the students' jobs to, and this is how you actually you get your grade. I don't grade you on um, you know, A, B, C, D. Do you participate on the discussion boards? Share, do you share your experiences um, on these issues with the other students? And do you respond and help other students through your um, responses and experiences? So it's a kind of a combination, I think, of the, the, the concepts, uh, the broader concepts, and that, that class interaction between students that actually make it worth doing. Great. Um, I put a link uh, in our chat box to it. It's it's ala-apa.org slash certification, and you can find more information about it there. And um, that was the last question, but I've got one more um, comment here. One of our attendees reminded me, um, and I'll shamefully plug Rails um, for networking <laughs> groups and forums. Um, you know, we do have, yeah, for, for – um, if, if folks are not aware, we do have community forums on um, a variety of topics, and there is a technology one, and it's just an email to serve. You can sign up, and, and you can toss your questions up there, and, and I've seen people really helpful. But there's also um, other networking groups, and it's some of it's regional. Some of it is by what type of role you're in at your library. So if um, maybe I can post a link to that as well. Let me go to our... Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Networking, networking page. So, you know, so we have in-person events as well for you to. Um, sorry about that. Indeed, indeed. 
You have. If I can, if I can speak to this, I've been yep. um, lucky go. to work with different rail staff for um, for a while now, and what I'm really impressed by is I know the the complexity of the the rail system and the 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 number of different communities that are uh, being served, uh, kind of under the, the the guidance or umbrella of rails. Um, and that can make uh, things, you know, fairly complex sometimes, especially with uh, with the, the variety of libraries uh, in Illinois, the uh, you know rural to the to the like the super rural to the super urban. Mm -hmm. And what's impressed me about rail staff is that everyone embraces that um, that challenge and and kind of works through it every day. So I think, uh, in particular, your organization. Um, uh, you know, nothing, of course, is perfect, but by golly, I, everyone I've talked to uh, gives it their all um, uh, every day in, in terms, especially in terms of that, that reprioritization <laughs> process. And so I, I think that that's uh, certainly the best asset that you have. I appreciate that. Thanks, Carson. And we do have, um, you know, technology is one of our number one topics that we get asked about. So, you know, please watch for more um, training opportunities uh, coming up this spring. We've got some webinars scheduled and some, some in-person things that I think um, will be really fun. So um, keep an eye out for that. So um, I guess it's about 3 o'clock. So Carson, thank you so much for your time today and all that really, really helpful information. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. All right. And so thank you all for joining us today. I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks.